Ladies and gentlemen, would you please be upstanding to welcome the chair of these proceedings, Paulette Brown, and our venerable speakers for the evening. Please join in applause. The motion before the House tonight is this House believes nations should adopt quotas for women on corporate boards. I will now introduce tonight's speakers. For the motion in order of speaking, Joanna Maycock. I'm sorry, in the order of speaking is Irene Natividad. Got it. Yes, Joanna Maycock and Hillary Gosser. Against the motion in order of speaking is Lorraine Hack, Kimberly Weissel, and Mary Gowdy. You have their biographical details in your power shift brochures. I will invite the first two speakers from either side of the motion to speak alternative, alternately, proposing speakers, proposing, proposing, I'm sorry, Proposing speaker followed by the opposing speaker, each for a maximum of six minutes. I will then invite the second two speakers from either side to speak in the same order, each for a maximum of six minutes each. After these four speeches, I will open the debate to the floor. It will be your chance to speak. I shall be enforcing strict time limits on each of the speakers, and the same rule applies for contributions from the floor. Please keep your comments extremely concise, up to a maximum of one minute each. Please give us your name, and remember to include whether you are supporting or opposing the motion. A bell will ring to enforce these time limits. I will gently chide transgressors. <laughs> Once all floor contributions have been received, I will then invite the final two platform speakers to sum up proposing speaker followed by opposing speaker, maximum of five minutes each. Please note very carefully which side of the exit door that you leave by. There is a brass dividing bar A's to the right, no's to the left. Tellers stationed at the door will be counting the votes cast by this means. Professor Linda Scott ha -ha, will be announcing the result of the debate for those of you who are invited to join us at dinner at the reception and dinner later this evening. It will be posted on the website as well. May I remind you all that the rules of the House note that booing or hissing speakers or coughing needlessly is both a grave and pointless discourtesy and is an abuse of the forms of this house. We will now begin the debate. I now call on Irene Natividad to propose the motion, this house believes nations should adopt quotas for women on corporate boards. Twenty years ago, I was appointed to the board of a Fortune 100 company. I was one of three women in a board of 21, a large board, or 14%. At that time, that was considered an all-time high. Now, cycle to 2016, and right now, only 20% of board seats are held by women in the 500 largest companies in the United States, the S&P 500. Now, that's supposed to be something terrific right now, but that percentage doesn't represent the 80% of consumers who happen to be women, the 45% of the labor force who happen to be female, the 35% of small and medium uh, business owners, and 40% of investors who happen to be women. Booz Inc. actually called women the third billion to somehow refer to the economic clout of women 
um, as, com as combining China's and India's economies together if their talents and their expertise were fully utilized. What I'm suggesting here is that women are important stakeholders in the economies of the world, and they must be represented on corporate boards because they can impact on the profitability of any company in the world globally and also in the United States. Well, I can guarantee you right now, women's expertise and talents are not present in the corporate boards of the largest companies in the world. Our latest research, only 17.8% of board seats are held by women in the 200 largest companies in the world based in 26 countries. Well, that glacial pace somehow was contested by Norway, which got the ball rolling on quotas. They said 40% of board seats must now be allocated for women and companies must comply within a two-year period. If they don't comply, companies will be dissolved. Well, no companies were dissolved and 40% was reached. Right now, 22 countries have quotas for women on corporate boards. Okay, and that number is still growing, and their percentages targets range from a high of 40 to 30 percent to only one woman director, at least one woman director per company. Most European countries have quotas, but so does Malaysia, so does India, so does United Arab Emirates. So, I mean, when, when you look at the momentum in that direction, it sort of tells you that something is happening here. So the quotas work? Well, they absolutely do. Before the quota, France was at 7.1% representation of women on boards. Today, and the SBF 120, the 120 largest companies, they are at 33%. And if you were to look at their blue chip companies, the CAC 40, they're way over 40%. Italy, Italy, 1.9% at the bottom of the barrel before their quota. They're now at 23%, moving towards a target of 33%. India, two years ago, they were at 5.1%. They're now at 13%, even though their law only stipulates at least one woman per corporate board. That is a rate of change that would have been unimaginable before the quota happened. Now, will all the countries somehow reach the percentage mandated by law? No, they won't, because many of them do not have strong compliance measures. But at the end of the day, they will end up with a far larger pool of experienced women directors. So no longer can a company say, oh, we would love to have a woman on a board. We just can't find them. Where are they going to find them now? Now, a favorite, a favorite complaint against quotas is that somehow the quota will bring in the great unwashed, the unqualifieds, if you will, the incompetence, just to fulfill a number. This is an argument that bores me at this point. <laughs> Many women actually even buy this argument, and I tell them, get over it. A quota is just a door that we must push to open. We must somehow make change and make it far more quickly than what is happening now. Quotas have deadlines. They are not forever. You know, at one point, we thought if we could just get more women in the workplace, if we could just get them educated, they will rise naturally to the top. Meritocracy will win. Well, natural didn't happen, as evidenced by the fact that only 17% of executive positions are held by women, and only 4.2% of CEOs are now female. In all of uh, Western Europe, only three women CEOs. Okay? So what quotas do is accelerate women's access to corporate leadership roles. In addition to that, my friend at the Central Bank of Italy said that quotas actually helped them to professionalize board recruitment. That, that the men were now being looked at in the same way as they are reviewing the women. So it's no longer what Luigi recommends to, you know, to veto. They now have to look beyond the normal enclaves of male clubs in order to find the women in order to comply with the law. So the question is, will, uh, will quotas somehow be the only strategy for arriving at, you know, uh, women on boards, an increase in women on boards? No, there are other strategies and you'll hear about them later. Will quotas be the answer to all of the inequities women face in the workplace? No, they won't. Companies will accompany, must accompany quotas with other measures to create a pipeline for women's leadership into uh, into many, many companies' um, boards. So, Michel Landel probably said it very best. He said, quotas are a jolt to the system. If, if women don't have quotas, they will wait forever. Well, I am now 67 years old, 
forever is not an option for me. So I support quotas because for too long, women have suffered whisker burns for the lip service that men have paid to the sharing of power. <laughs> Thank you. I now call on Lorraine Heck to oppose the motion. I'm going to do a little bit of both here. Who likes to be told what to do? Anybody? Who likes things foisted upon them? You don't have a choice. You got to do this. Anybody? Do you think there might be resentment with something like this? We talked a lot about partnership today in a lot of the sessions. Does, do quotas feel very partnership-y to you? They don't, they don't to me. They don't to our side. Might someone's success, even in a small way, be linked to those who might have been inadvertently alienated in this process? Don't we all know that there is a much better chance of success when there is buy-in across the board, not mandates. We all know the statistics. We've heard them throughout the day. We have access to them. We all agree women are underrepresented on boards. We all agree this has to change. That's why we're here, right? The question is how. What are the root causes? What are the key contributing causes? What is a meaningful and sustainable solution, not a Band-Aid? As we look to fix the gender situation on boards, hopefully with not having the golden skirts issue we've seen in Europe, which my colleagues will speak about, what about females' progression in the executive ranks? That's been going at a glacial pace. Some say no change in the last couple of years. Can you do boards without thinking about that? What about building a pipeline, which I got to tell you, I think is the real issue. How do you build a pipeline of young women, middle management that will be the CEOs, that will be on boards? It's really important. I chair a nonprofit organization, which the entire premise of is building the next generation of women leaders for the C-suite and for the board. What are board qualifications? We hear a lot, and I'm on the side where I have these conversations with clients. I want a sitting CEO. I want a sitting CFO on my board. Well, that, that limits it dramatically, right? They're just in the US, not that many in those spots. It's the lazy person's kind of recruiting for a board. If you dig deeper, you ask, well, where are your gaps? What do you need? What don't you have currently in the organization? You dig deeper and start asking different questions. You get answers like, we could really use an executive comp expert, which, by the way, a lot of HR experts, which most of which happen to be women, most of whom happen to be women, or you realize they really need digital expertise or cybersecurity expertise. Or experience living on the ground, being in Asia. And a lot of those won't be a sitting CEO or a sitting CFO. So we should be focusing on preparing women for boards, preparing women for the C-suite. We should be broader on the qualifications discussion and the development discussion. How do we also develop cultures of inclusiveness at the corporate level, at the board level, so that women will stay, be effective, and succeed, both at companies and on boards? We need a bigger solution here that I think is not quotas. This will take time. This will take money. This will take thought. It is a collective responsibility, not one body imposing something on another body. The collective responsibility, we believe, 
is business and corporations, it is government, it is search firms to some degree, they advise, don't necessarily make decisions, it's educational institutions, and yes, I think it's the media as well in that equation. Let's find a more constructive, collaborative way forward where we develop, we educate, we mentor, we truly ready women leaders to be women leaders and successful. Quotas get you on the runway, they do not get you to the destination. Let's set ourselves up for the best, longer term way to succeed. Let's make impactful and sustainable change in the boardroom and at the C-suite. Thank you. I now call Joanna Maycock to speak in support of the motion. Thank you very much. I'm going to use this wooden podium because I don't get many chances to speak at this kind of thing. <laughs> Feels quite powerful, huh? So I believe that quotas are the necessary adrenaline shot that we need to accelerate the path towards much needed gender diversity in our decision making spaces and to overcome the centuries of exclusion of women from power. Quotas, women-only shortlists, any form of affirmative action, they of are often equally disliked by women and by men, by many of you in the hall today. But let me tell you a not so big secret, they do work, and we know they do. I'm gonna read quite a powerful quote from a recent European Parliament uh, report recommending the introductions of quotas. Um, Today, an informal system of quotas is de facto in play, where men are privileged over women, where men choose other men for decision-making positions. It's not a formalized system of quotas, but nevertheless, a systematic and very real deep-rooted culture of positive treatment of men. In other words, we are in fact still operating in the context of hundreds of years of male-only shortlists and men giving people that remind them of themselves, i.e. other men, promotions and positions of power. As we've seen from recent stories in the press, they even choose men who are called John or Michael rather than choose women. So ironically, if you hate quotas, it's imperative that we introduce quotas to undo the damage of hundreds of years of hidden quotas that favor men. Indeed, a continuing belief in the myth of a meritocratic society is one of the major obstacles to the more widespread introduction of what we know to be successful strategies, such as quotas. Love them or hate them, I know that quotas work. I know because over the past decade or so, various European governments and political parties have introduced quota systems to successfully increase the participation and representation of women in parliaments, in state institutions and in corporate decision-making bodies. Many parliaments in Europe now have more than a third of all seats held by women. It's not enough. We lobby for 50-50, but it still makes a huge difference. And that is mainly in, uh, thanks to the introduction of quotas by political parties and national governments across Europe. The European Parliament itself has seen the proportion of women elected rise at every successive election. Now we have more than 37% women in the European Parliament. I should point out that maybe sounds good compared to your Congress here. Um, but even that means there are 200 more men in the European Parliament than women. So even 37% is not enough. What's more though, by going beyond the critical mass of 33% of women, we think that's about the, the, the number which makes a difference, we see a transformation in the culture and the design of political and decision-making processes in those institutions. There are simply no more spaces where there are no women. There were, there were always women in the room, and that makes a difference. Now, bringing the, the issue of corporate boards into play. Globally, we heard from Irene, uh, women hold just around 12% of seats on corporate boards. Let me turn that around. That means that 88% of all the seats on corporate boards globally are held by men. European countries have continued to lead the way on gender diversity in corporate boards. We've seen a really significant increase in women's participation in corporate boards from just 12% in 2011 to beyond 20% today. And this is almost all as a result of the introduction of quotas. 
So quotas have been successfully introduced in many of the most significant economies in Europe. I'm talking about Belgium, France, Netherlands, Italy, Spain, and most recently Germany. And all those countries are seeing increased, dramatically increased numbers of women in the boardroom. Italy, Irene mentioned, it, I can assure you is not a feminist paradise, uh, but has seen, <laughs> has seen an increase from like five, less than 10% to nearly 25% in the five years since quotas were introduced. We've also seen in Europe that voluntary measures can work, especially where the public sector, which is a big employer in many European countries, sets and delivers transparent targets for women's leadership. Um, but the problem is, and I'm sorry, they should say the threat of the introduction of quotas at European level has also acted as a very powerful incentive for action. But the pace of change with these voluntary measures is just too slow for the dramatic gear shift we need today to overcome the historic exclusion of women from positions of power. And that's why so many European governments eventually decided to introduce quota systems. Now, quotas should never be seen as a goal in themselves nor should they be introduced in isolation from all the other measures we know support the full participation of women in the corporate world at all levels. Quotas are not a panacea. They don't solve all the problems of underrepresentation of women in decision making. The dizzying pace of change and the disruption in our economies right now requires decisive action to ensure that we have the most effective and resilient corporate governance possible. And we in this hall today all know that means ensuring a critical mass of women sit in every single boardroom. Experience and the evidence is crystal clear. Quotas have proven to be simply the most effective strategy to speed up the kind of step change we need to transform the gender diversity of corporate decision making. Ignoring the evidence is denying us all the opportunity for the power shift we need to face the challenges and harness the opportunities of the 21st century. We owe it to the next generation to take action now to speed up the change we all know is needed. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Kimberly Weissel to oppose the motion. Good evening. I need to begin by saying that my opinions are not those of my employer, Inc., or our holding company, Mensuedo Ventures. Sorry, they are those of this bench. And this bench strongly believes that quotas are an inappropriate and damaging response to the question of why there are not enough women on corporate boards. Everyone in this room wants to see more women on boards of directors. That is not in dispute. But what we don't want is just to have bodies in seats. We want a real change in who holds power, how it's wielded, and for whom. We want a power shift. It's why we're here. And with quotas, we don't get any of that. Quotas give us, if we're lucky, a nice statistic that we can point to, which we've heard many of so far, and we can pretend that we've made progress. There are numerous examples of quotas that have gone bad. In this country, there's the SBA set-aside program for small businesses, and there is the increasing dismay over affirmative action in our institutions of higher learning. The quotas that I'm going to concentrate on most are the ones most relevant to tonight's discussion, and that's the quotas in Norway. I know we've heard about how they've been successfully introduced, but I want to go through some of the statistics, and you can decide for yourself which are the lies, which are the damn lies, and which are the statistics. So in 2000 in Norway, only 5% of, of, of board seats were held by women. They passed a law moving that to 40% in 2003. They made it compulsory in 2006 and set the deadline for 2008. Now they've got about 40% of publicly held companies of board seats held by women. It's true that no companies in Norway were dissolved. Do you know why that is? That's because the law was meant to apply to 563 publicly traded companies. Before the deadline, 384 of those changed their corporate structures so that the quotas would not apply to them. Can you imagine if 68% of the S&P 500 went private over five years? There is no law in the country that would be considered good if it had that as a side effect. The other thing that happened is that young companies in Norway looking to go public increasingly chose to do it somewhere else. Now, it's true that the UK has become a more powerful money center in the time since those quotas were passed. But between 1997 and 2005, the percentage of Norwegian companies that chose to go public in the UK multiplied four times. 
the percentage of Finnish and Swedish companies that decide to do this dropped by half. Now, at first, I thought this was great for Norway, and it's a way for them to export their most unreconstructed chauvinists. But we all know it doesn't work that way. These people are actually living in Norway still, but their country is not getting the economic benefit of their work. So who are quotas good for? A distressingly small number of people. Remember that when we talk about who's affected by these and the effects in companies, we're talking about the remaining third of companies that were the most open-minded and willing to deal with the quotas. It's good for the women who became board members, of whom there are surprisingly few, and it's good for women who are in the top five best paid positions in their companies. That's about it. Before the quotas, the highest number of board seats held by any one woman in Norway was four. Now it's up to eight. If we look, and this is why some of these women, as you've heard, have been referred to as golden skirts. Another way to look at this is with the raw numbers of women who are serving. Before the quotas in 1998, there were 294 women. If we extrapolate and figure out how many women should be sitting on boards after the quotas, we get up around 2,300. I'm willing to give some leeway here, but we have 731 at last count. It's just simply not enough. And no one else is benefiting from this. As one study said, quote, we fail to find evidence of any gains for female employees in these less rarefied executive layers. So there's no obvious effect on other highly qualified women, there's no change in the gender wage gap, and there's no change in female representation in top positions. So you have to ask, what are we really gaining here? The other thing we should point out is that in Norway, only 3% of board chairs are women. In the US, where the overall numbers are much worse, 5% of board chairs are women. What this shows us is that if a company has to adopt quotas or be dissolved, it will follow the rule to the letter. But it also shows us that women who gain their positions that way are not wielding power commensurate with their qualifications. The easiest and most accurate way to sum this all up is that quotas for women on boards do not work. And I know that's depressing because we all know how much longer it's going to take where we, to get where we want to go. If we do this by other means, I would say to you that we have no choice. There is some precedent for change being made organically within companies. Intel, frankly, is a good example of this. They've had a lot of trouble recently, but when they decided they were going to become a more diverse company and tied it to managers' bonuses, 43% of the people that they hired last year were either women or people of color. And they did not include Southeast Asians in that mix. Just an interesting note there. Um, so there are definitely other alternatives that work. I don't want women to have to prove ourselves all over again. Right now, every woman who's on a board in the US is there because she is immensely qualified, the same reason that every man is there. With quotas, every man is there because he's immensely qualified, and every woman is there because she's a woman. That is not what I want. It's not what I want for the women who are qualified to be on board seats but aren't getting calls. It's not what I want for the women in this room. It's not what I want for myself, and it's frankly not what I want for my daughters. For that reason, I'm asking you to join me and walk out to the left of that bar tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now open the debate to the floor. Come on, guys. <laughs> yes. You have to come up. Do I come up? No, just stay here. Yeah. Okay, so um, your I'm name? Uh, Louise Guido, uh, CEO of Change Corp, and I've been uh, a woman a long time. So. <laughs> like 61 years, girlfriend, I'm right behind you. And uh, I agree with the, uh, the proposed, the four, yeah, I'm all for that because having gone through uh, several generations um, of, of being uh, in, uh, you know, one of the first women to work at magazines, working with men, putting up with all the caca, putting up with this, putting up with that, blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on and on. It doesn't change, it doesn't change, it doesn't change. And so, yes, you do need to mandate it. And you need to mandate it because some women are just not strong enough to make it on their own, and some women need that little push. Not because they're weak, not because it is, it's just in our DNA. Me, on the other hand, I'm very verbal, so I've always pretty much gotten what I wanted. But when I didn't get what I wanted, I started my own, you know, I took my bat and ball and it went elsewhere, and I started my own companies. 
So I was on the board of my own companies and I didn't have to mandate, I mandated it myself. I just got there. And nobody was able to kick me off. And I will say one thing about women in business and women that why it should be mandated. Because we have waited long enough. I mean, seriously, do we need to like, you know, mandate certain things in this country. We had to mandate the vote for women to vote. We had to mandate civil rights. We had to mandate disabilities. We had to mandate LGBT. We have to mandate because people are just not smart enough to figure it out all by themselves. And Norway has like got 12 people in it, so they're not a good judge. <laughs> you know, I mean, good on Norway. Way to go, go, go. But like, you know, they're cold all the time. Here in the United States, we have an ability to be able to make that difference because of that. So I encourage you to go with that side. Girlfriends, very, that, that girl, that crowd over there is good. I encourage you to do that and join the right side. Thank you. Yes, okay. Yes. Right there. Oh. This lady in the white jacket? You're using your minute. Okay, sorry. I, I'm Laurel Steinfield. I am at the University of Bentley, used to be with Linda at Oxford. And I am for ma uh, mandating the quotas, partially because as much as you say Norway has had dismal responses, all you're doing is saying, let's let patriarchy continue. And we have to address the systematic issues that are there. And one of the ways is to do quotas. Secondly, having women on boards helps to change our representations of what women can do. For me, it started to get me to think about maybe being on a board member. Like, you have to start somewhere. And so we've got a number of issues that need to be addressed. And having women on boards does that in regards to changing the systemic issues, in regards to changing the gender representation issues, and starting to get women actually getting men to recognize the need to make room for women and getting them to then share the tacit knowledge about how you manage boards. Because otherwise, they just let women kind of figure it out for themselves. But the more women you have on the board, the more they have to engage them. And I think the only way that you can do that is to actually do the quotas. Okay. Here. There's no way. Pull it, pull um, it down. Pull it down. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah. Go. No one else will be able to use it after this. So uh, Michelle said a case. My question is actually posed to both sides, and I don't know if this is allowed, Madam Chair, but I have a question. We talk Are all you the to time. Give your position. My position? Your position for or against. Okay, like this woman, this is my personal opinion, cannot be tied back to Ernst & Young in any way. <laughs> I am for quotas only because if we don't start we cannot make progress. However, my question is. No questions. Damn. <laughs> I'm also, Michelle, uh, like the person spoke before, I'm also for quotas. Um, Boards should re reflect the data. Women are 50% of the consumers, 50% of the electorate in many, many countries. They should be 50% of the boards. Doesn't a board shouldn't represent your consumer base and the people who are using your product? So quotas. We got to start somewhere. Yes, right here. In the interest of having a debate, I am <laughs> I'm against quotas. Because just for the same reason that um, in our programming, when we're looking at gender equity, we're looking at um, equality, when we're looking at, you know, just counting up the number of women on some kind of a committee or the number of women who've been trained or the number of women who are um, in whatever position in our programming, uh, counting them up and saying that's uh, equity is ridiculous. And uh, so I think that it just is going to get us into a trap of counting uh, and pretending that we've done something when we really haven't. Gentlemen here. I'm for quotas, primarily because of the fact that it allows a different perspective in the boardroom. That is something you're not going to go and get right now with Your a whole bunch of people with the same background. What is your name? My name is Edgar Baum. And I'm for it because of the fact that it will facilitate a different thinking in the organization. If we want to go and respect the fact that the people that would be selected, they would still be selected on merit. And they can be mentored. See, our natural psychological mindset 
is that, oh, let's go and pick the guy, because he's gone and done this before, rather than let's look for the woman that has gone and done this and demonstrated their capability or the capacity to go and deliver in this area. So with that, I'm for quotas. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, hello, I'm Cindy Drakeman with Double X Economy. And I am for women in positions of leadership and having their voices heard. And I think what, for me, I'm, I'm actually very deeply ambivalent about quotas. Uh, I think we need a mechanism, but we can't see that it, it as an ends in and of itself. And so I think when we talk about quotas, there is a sense that this will be that trigger. And I, to be honest, haven't unfortunately heard anything I agree with as a better trigger to make that happen. But I think we have to think about what comes next. All right, because we don't want to get to the point where you say, well, you said 33%, we're done, that's it. You know, How do we actually change the mindset? How do we change the way people think and acknowledge the contributions that women can make and the importance of diversity and inclusion? So I am for quotas, but I am really for women in positions and getting the recognition they deserve. And if you guys can come up with a better solution, then I'm for that too. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, right here. And uh, and right here, second. So I'm course. Mira Sanyal, and while I completely agree that we do need women on the board, I'll just share a personal experience why I'm with this side of the group. I'm invited to a lot of boards in my country in India, and I always start with the question, are you inviting me because I'm, I'm a woman? And the answer invariably is yes. And then I say, that's not what I want to be there. I want to be there because I'm me, and because I'm going to bring something to your board. And I think we need to stand up for the fact that we are good, and in many cases, we are better. We don't need quotas. Thank you. Yes, break the glasses, yes. I'm Betsy Teutsch from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I am in favor of quotas for women on boards because boards do better when they have more women on them. Their returns are better and their risk management is more reasonable. And I think that um, we need to help boards along to tap into women's uh, specific contributions. Thank you. Okay. I think that... Um, Linda. Oh, Linda. Pardon me? Yes. Just enough time. white male friend back in the United Kingdom who sits on a whole bunch of corporate boards and he said to me one day Linda the scariest thing is not that it's all old white men on corporate boards it's that it's the same old white men on all the corporate boards all right and so what is really I think at stake here is not it's not only the women's rights which is of course in my book the most important thing but there's also the issue of a cronyistic system that has a lot of power for everyone, that, that really decisions are made in corporate boardrooms that affect everyone all the time, and in no other aspect of our decision-making apparatus would we be allowing it to happen in this secretive, cronyistic way, back-scratching way. Um, another thing that I just want to point out, two bits of, of uh, data issued, because this is kind of what I do. Uh, we have to be careful about those evaluations of the Norwegian uh, experiment, because most of those studies, or in fact, the main study came out so quickly after the change that it could not possibly have been a reasonable assessment of that impact. It was almost like a setup. You got to be careful about this, right? And um, so, and I do think that it's also very important to recognize recognize that actually there is an overwhelming amount of data that shows that more women on corporate boards has fantastic positive implications in terms of performance, but also transparency and accountability. I think one of the reasons to be willing to enact a quota should always be whether or not there is a compelling state or social interest, and I think we're there. Thank you. Thank you all. I now call on Hillary Gosser to sum up in support of the motion. We've all heard some compelling facts today during the sessions and some heartfelt comments from the audience. Thank you. Um, but I stand here to represent the reality of corporate life. I sit on boards. Invariably, I'm the only woman. And I work in an industry, the tech industry, where 
where I'm always subject to conscious and unconscious bias. And so when I sit on boards and I'm the only woman, and when I sit in my investment committee, so stepping back, I am a venture capitalist. My firm invests in small, growing, disruptive technology companies. We're a venture firm. And I sit on the investment committee of our firm. And uh, we're 12 partners, and I'm the only woman. And so this is the reality of the world that I live with corporate boards that I want to share with you. And I think there's three main points. One, technology, which is our future. Two, the speed of change, which is no speed at all. And three, realism versus idealism. So starting with uh, technology, 100 years ago in Detroit, you know, Detroit reinvented the workforce, reinvented the workforce because of the car. Today, the same thing is happening in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is the 21st century workforce. And Silicon Valley's products are equally as ubiquitous as Detroit's. The smartphone, the internet, the way we communicate, the way we share data, the way we live our lives, this is being disrupted by Silicon Valley. And these are the companies that are driving transformation in our society. These companies, though, still mimic the industrial age when it comes to gender diversity. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, it has a, and, and the tech companies have an abysmal record, frankly, of gender diversity. This came to light last year. I'm not sure if any of you remember the Kleiner Perkins case. Kleiner Perkins is a bastion of venture capital in Silicon Valley, and they had to defend themselves against a gender lawsuit. Um, uh, what came out was some frightening statistics. Uh, number one, only 4% of leadership in venture firms making investments are women. Number two, 77% of venture capitalists have never put a woman on the boards of companies that they invest in. It's just ridiculous. And this is the, this is the industry. This is the industry, my industry. You buy the smartphones, you shop online. This is the industry that's at the vanguard of the forefront of transformational change. And if this industry doesn't do it, it's going to take too long. We need this industry to lead the way. You know, my partners are, are fabulous. My partners are wonderful men, well-intentioned, benevolent, smart. They also struggle with this. And if they're not getting it, and we don't get it as a firm, we need to mandate it. The second point, aside from technology, is that about the speed of change. And we all know, and I think you mentioned it, uh, change happens very slowly. And it's very, it's, it's, it's very seldom that change happens uh, in a way that's not got some social impact, that's not got law that invariably getting involved. So, you know, it took 56 years for the suffragettes to get women the vote. It took another 50 years for uh, civil rights uh, for, for everybody. Um, LGBT, women's rights on their bodies, these are social issues that are only being changed because of legal mandates. You know, we all as humans have an inertia to change and when we do what's familiar, especially in the business world. Um, you know, in the business world when we need to solve problems, we call on our network and our network typically is, a, is men. And when we recruit, we recruit people via referrals. So at our portfolio companies, uh, we, uh, 50 percent, more than 50 percent of people who are recruited are via referrals, which means men are hiring men. At salesforce.com, the number's 56 percent. At Twitter, the number's 40 percent, 40 percent via referrals. And so women just don't have a seat at the table. When I sit in our investment committee, we're looking at these fabulous women who are founding businesses and who are... Um, producing products that are bought mostly by the she economy, by the, con by the powerful woman consumer. Um, these are businesses like Etsy and Birchbox and uh, Rent the Runway and Dry Bar, businesses that you know. These are female founded businesses, but it's men making the decision as to whether to invest in them. It's men making the decision about whether uh, these companies have merit. Um, you know, <laughs> I, would say, I would say that my, my industry is really uh, enlightened when it comes to gadgets and not very enlightened when it comes to gender issues. And, um, and we, we, we need something that's going to kickstart the change. Um, and so as you think about this, we're all being asked to vote by walking out of the door. And so there's two sides, I think, that you can walk out on. You can walk out on the left side, which is idealism, or you can walk out on the right-hand side, which is reality, which is realism. And if you choose to walk out on the idealistic side, you're voting for an ideal, perfect world in which benevolent people bring change about at a very slow pace. We could wait for that, but there's no evidence that change happens. And in the tech industry, we'll be waiting another 30 years if we're to wait for that to happen, based on my observations. 
we're all going to walk out the door together because we're all in a struggle together. But I'm going to cheer for all of you who walk out on the right-hand side because I think that you're voting for a step change in society. You're, step, you're voting for a step function. That's what's going to drive this. And people need leaders. Women in tech need leaders. And tech is the future. So without the future as a vanguard, as an example, I think it's just going to take too long. And for those idealists who work, walk out on the left-hand side, I ask you to... Look your daughter in the eyes and explain to her why you were willing to walk out on the side of change that is going to take more than 30 years, which is not in her lifetime. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. I now call on Mary Gowdy to sum up in opposing the motion. Very interesting so far. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, 2000, in 2010, my colleague uh, Helena Morrissey and a very close friend and I decided on an afternoon that we were going to make a power shift in the United Kingdom. At the same time, change was happening there in government and governance of boards. In the United Kingdom, nobody can sit on a board now for longer than two terms of three years and three years. Chairman can no longer sit on a board for five years and a bit more without change. And now under the new regulatory situation, um, people cannot sit on, on more than three boards on financial issues. So we're going to see change, and we have been seeing change. When we started, to, and we don't believe in quotas, and I'm going to tell you why, because we believe men and women working together can make this change, and it has to be cradle to grave. Let me tell you that. You cannot make the change in any other way, because with quotas, you end up with the same sort of people and the same grouping and who do not let in the other people. So that is why we decided and have seen change in 2010 to work with chairman of corporate companies, with government, and persuaded government to make change, and also the regulators to make change. When we started, it was 12.5% women on boards. Today, it is 26% women on boards, and we're nearly up to the 30% that we had promised to have in the next year. That is also working with the C-suite, and that is really, really important, because that is the future again, because we have to look at the future. Quotas only looks at the future for the short term, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We agree, my team, with many things that have said today, which is very much in the situation in America, but we have to be global. If we're not global, we can't win this argument, and that is why not only did Helena and I set up the 30% club in the United Kingdom, we decided we had to work with the countries of the G8 and the G20 so we could influence those agendas, and we have been able to get this issue on those agendas. And that is where you make the real, real change, because it has to change the global regulation around global boards. So coming on now, why the 30% club with a goal of achieving a minimum of 30% women on FTSE 100 boards, currently stated, as I said, at 26%, have accelerated progress. It has been achieved through leadership in our member chairs and in CEOs, in addition to crucial recognition with the political situation across the political divide. It is not Labour, it's not Conservative. It is across the political divide. And that is what, if you want to make change in this country, you have to talk to government and you have to tell them this is how it's to be done. And you have to also work with business schools as well to accept women. Um, we have managed to get scholarships for women to go on to business school at a, the right time. And this is possible, and they want to make that change. And I'd just like to say the reasons why I um, and my team resist the call for quotas. There's no trickle-down effect. Quotas increase the number of women at the very top, but there is little evidence of a trickle-down effect. In the Norway, the indication is of any significant impact on women beyond the boardroom and themselves. No trickle-down, no trickle-up either effect. Quotas do not necessarily lead to female CEOs. No surge in female CEOs in Norway. Quotas do not necessarily lead to boardroom turnover. Oftentimes, rather than refresh the boards, just add a few more people on. 
Quotas can increase the sense of tokenism, risk of women being seen, and we're not an endangered species, so we don't want to be seen in that way, of being appointed by virtue in the fact they are women and not because they are by their own skills. Unclear whether quotas produce sustainable solutions. That's what we want. We want to be sustainable. Quotas is only for a short time. Um, seeing there is little evidence to trickle down effect, with little reason to think that quotas would be able to change broader corporate culture, may only benefit a small number of women. In Norway, quotas led to a very, very small number of women sitting on multiple boards in order to fulfill the quota. Multiple boards, how can you think a board through if you're sitting on six and seven? Three is the most boards that anybody should be allowed to sit on. Remember, you're responsible on a board for the 20,000, 30,000 people's payroll. We're responsible for their mortgages. We're responsible for their pensions. That is why it is wrong to sit on more than three boards. Um, so, a number of, of quota requirements. The undermining point is having quotas in the first place. Not necessary for change. There is little substantial increase in the number of women sitting on the FTSE boards without the use of quotas, which suggests that business-led approach can work. Detracts from the business case for diversity. Research showing the link between female appointments to board improved companies' performance, business need to recognize diversity in its own interests, not to have governments to enforce this. So we have to look at it, because this is not a women's issue, this is a business issue, and this is the way we must look to forcing this. So I ask you today to vote against quotas. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. And thank you, everyone, for coming and participating in such a lively and informative debate this evening. May I remind you of how you vote as you leave the hall. There is a brass dividing bar, A's to the right, no's to the left.